Hello everyone, this is the fourth lecture in optimization and this one deals with uh, differential evolution. So let's get started. So like many other evolutionary algorithms, differential evolution is a stochastic population-based search strategy. It has quite a few similarities with standard EAs, but it differs in that the distance and the direction information of the, of the solutions that are represented as vectors um, guides the search. It was also developed specifically for continuous valued landscapes if you recall, typical EAs like genetic algorithms, for example, works with discrete valued problems. So it's a bit string that represents your solution. Now, for many of the standard EAs, variation in the population is achieved through your reproduction operators. So crossover and mutation. Crossover is applied first, and then mutation is applied on the resulting offspring. And the mutation step sizes are then sampled from some predetermined probability distribution function. Um, which might be dynamic, so it might change throughout the algorithm, but the point is, it's a predetermined probability function. Now, D differs from this approach in that, firstly, mutation is applied to a clone of the parent to generate what's known as a trial vector, and then this is used within the crossover operator to produce a single offspring. So mutation is applied first to a clone of a parent, and then that clone is used in a crossover. And then lastly, mutation step sizes are not sampled from any known probability distribution function. These are determined dynamically within the algorithm itself. And um, as you'll see later on, that is a very powerful property of DEs. Okay, so let's quickly talk about difference vectors. Now, the positions of individuals provide valuable information about the fitness landscape. Now, provided that individuals are well distributed, and of course that the population is large enough, the initial population will be a good representation of the entire search base. So you assume that it's, that it's well distributed across the entire search base. Now the distances between these individuals will be inverse proportional to the size of the population. Now this you can verify with the thought experiment. So if you have two individuals in your population, chances are that they'll be most of the time about um, half the, you know, the width of the search base away from one another, if you can, if you can think of it like that. Um, if you have an infinite number of individuals, they're going to be on top of one another. So these distances between the individuals basically give some idea about the size of the population. And then, of course, as the search progresses, so as mutation is applied and crossover, reproduction, an individual starts to converge to a local optimum. And of course, hopefully that's the global optimum the distances between the individuals will start to decrease. So they will move away and they will, they will get, go extinct in areas in the search base that's, that's unoptimal and they will start to cluster around um, local optimus. Okay, so that means that the distances between individuals can be seen as a good indication of the diversity of the population. The larger these values are, the more diverse and of course the closer they are, the less diverse. Now, mutation step sizes should actually then be based on the distances between these individuals. So large step sizes to explore the search base in the beginning and small step sizes to exploit good regions once the distances between individuals have shrunk. Now, differential evolution measures the distances between random individuals by creating what's known as distance vectors. And these are then used to determine the step sizes during the mutation. So it's as simple as that. The random individuals measure their distances and these distances is then used in your mutation function. Okay, so let's quickly have a look at the advantage of using these difference vectors to guide the mutation step sizes. Firstly, of course, information about the fitness landscape is used to guide the search. So you don't have to guess values. Um, mutation step sizes will also, you know, naturally approach a normal or a Gaussian distribution. Um, given that the population is sufficiently large. The mean of this distribution will be zero um, if every individual has an equal uh, selection probability. So that means that xi minus xj has the same probability as xj minus xi to be chosen. And of course, it all depends on who you choose first, but they should be um, equally likely to occur. And then, of course, you will have a mean that's zero. A zero mean will also ensure that genetic drift is kept as small as possible. Now you might be wondering what genetic drift is, so let's have a look at that. So genetic drift is the change in the relative frequency with which a gene variant or an allele occurs in the population due to random sampling and chance. 
Now this random sampling and chance is what's key here. So this allele and the fact that it's uh, manifested within, a, within an organism is not there because of um, selective pressures, but it's, um, it's, it's simply there because of random chance. And this is what genetic drift is all about. So genetic drift may cause gene variants to disappear completely, uh, decreasing the diversity of the population. The effect, of, of course, is much greater in smaller populations and it's smaller in larger populations. So as a quick example, let's say you start with a jar. And in this jar, you've got 10 red marbles and you've got 10 blue marbles. And you also have a, two spare bags consisting of, of, of a lot of red marbles and, of course, a, another bag with a whole lot of blue marbles. So what you will do is blindfold it. You will take one marble out of this uh, first jar, see what color it is, and then place a marble from the corresponding bag into the next jar and then of course you replace your marble so by doing this process of course you end up with the, the, the jar exactly like this again with 10 red ones and 10 blue ones but the other jar the new jar will contain probably about 10 reds and 10 blues but it might also contain 11 reds and 9 blues for example or 11 blues for example and now the idea is if you repeat this process, but instead of using the first jar, you use the second jar to repeat this process. Now, because there's more red ones, it's uh, it's much more likely that you're going to end up with much more red ones. And of course, this just amplifies the entire process. So eventually, you're going to end up with a jar that only contains a single color, like all red ones. And that, of course, is what genetic drift is all about, is that the allele completely disappears out of random absolute random chance it's not like the blue ones were fitter or bigger or something like that when you were selecting them out of the jar and that is also to come back to our previous slide where we talked about the zero mean of your normal distribution that you get from the difference vectors that is why it is so important that that's a zero mean because if it's not a zero mean then you introduce bias to the algorithm and of course then you are going to find more genetic drift um, taking place in this in this whole process. So the DE mutation operator produces a trial vector for each individual from the current population by mutating a target vector with a weighted differential. This trial vector is then used in a crossover operator to produce an offspring. So we've already seen this. We have a trial vector that's 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 all um, mutated, and once the mutation takes place then we apply the crossover. Okay, so how does this happen? So for each parent, so in other words, for each element in the current population, we generate a trial vector UIT as follows. You select a target vector randomly in the entire population. So that's the X, XI1T, such that, of course, your, uh, the, the target vector and your parent is not the same. That's what this says. Okay, so it must be a unique um, vector. Then we select two individuals in this population such that, so in other words, XI2T and XI3T, such that um, your parent, your target vector, and these two uh, additional vectors that you choose, none of them are the same. They must be all different. And very, very importantly, I2 and I3, in other words, these two, must be chosen uniformly. Um, each individual must have an exactly the same probability of being chosen. You don't using fitness or anything like this here, because this is going to tell you something about the search base and how far individuals are from one another. And now, once you've got all this, we can calculate the trial vector. So the first thing is you calculate the difference vector. So what you do is you take the first one and you subtract it to the second one, xi2t minus x13t. So that's your difference vector. This you multiply it by a, by a scaling factor from 0 to infinity. But oh, you can imagine that something like 0 0.5 or whatever the case may be. And then you take this value and you simply add it to xi1t. So you add it to your target vector. And that gives you your trial vector. And now, once you've got your trial vector, of course, now you can do crossover. So the DE crossover operator implements a discrete recombination of the trial vector that we've just now created through the mutation process and the parent vector to produce an offspring XI prime. 
So a crossover is implemented as follows. Okay, so the child is either going to take something from the target vector or you're something going to take something from the parent. Okay, so uh, you define this uh, set of pertur perturbation points. Let's call it big J. And if an element is part of this big J, you select it from the target vector. And if this J is not an element in the in the in this in the set, then of course you take it from the the parent. So it all depends on the number of elements that's in this in this uh, in the set, or whether you're going to select it or not. Now calculating the set J is pretty straightforward. There's in theory currently two defined. It's the binomial crossover and the exponential crossover. But um, other, other techniques are, are definitely also possible. So binomial crossover resembles something that looks like a uniform crossover. So here a number of points are selected uh, based on some probability PR um, with the requirement that you have at least one such point selected. So if your probability PR is, is very high, then you're going to select quite a few of these points. If it's very low, it's going to be um, very few of these points. And so that's how you make up your J. The other um, alternative is exponential crossover. So here a random point is selected and then a number of consecutive points are selected, treating the whole list um, of potential crossover points as a circular array. And then of course the number that you select is again based on some probability. If the probability is larger, this sequence of points are, are much larger. And if it's smaller, of course, it's much shorter. So this, so this resembles something like... Uh, like a two-point crossover. Okay, so this geometrical representation makes it quite easy to see how this trial vector and everything works. So, so for each parent, there's my parent over here, x, i, t, we're going to select the target vector. So here's my target vector, x, i, 1, t, and now we're going to add to this a difference vector. So how do we calculate this difference vector? The difference vector is calculated by selecting two other um, random solutions. So we're going to select xi12t and xi3t and now we're going to um, subtract xi3 from xi2 from. So to do that we're going to negate x13 so it jumps from this position to over here then we add x12 to xi3 or minus x13 rather and it takes us to this point over here and of course now we need to multiply this with the value of beta and that takes us over here. So Based on this, we can see that beta is actually larger than one, so it's it's definitely in a in a serious exploration mode. And now that we've got this difference vector over here, we're going to add this to the target vector x i one. So x i one plus this difference vector gives us u i, and u i is now our trial vector. And this trial vector is now going to work together with the, with the parent vector over here, xi, to create uh, offspring. So let's see how that happens. So to create the offspring, uh, remember we have that uh, set j with the perturbation points. Now for the two-dimensional problem like this, it's actually pretty straightforward. We, uh, it's, we're going to take one element from the parent and one from the, from, the, um, from the trial vector. So as you can see, there's my child, xi prime. It's taken the y value from the parent and the x value from the trial vector, and it is the child. Now, I don't know if the child is much fitter than the parent, so um, if you have that uh, fitness evaluation function that we've seen in the standard algorithm, you're probably going to take the parent and discard the child. Yeah, it's a cruel world. So now that we've defined all the various um, functions that's present in differential evolution. Let's have a look at the general differential evolution algorithm. So we're going to start with our generation counter t, then we initialize the control parameters b, our, that scaling value, and of course pr which is that uh, um, for your crossover probability. Then we start with the initial population c0 that consists of ns individuals, each of, a, of the di uh, size of the dimensionality of the problem you're trying to solve. Then while some stopping condition is not met, then for each individual that's in the current population, we evaluate its fitness. We create a trial vector uit by applying mutation. Then we create an offspring xi prime by applying crossover. And then we select the best 
between the parent and the child to survive the next um, iteration. And of course, once this is done, we advance to the next generation. Now, this is the general differential evolution, but of course, there are, there are definitely variations on this. Um, the first I can quickly spot is, for example, the part here where we select from the best. Um, this selects from the current parent and from the child. But of course, we can also select from all the parents and all the child, all the you know all the offspring, so that you have a, a large generational gap that takes place. So all these variations are of course possible and should be experimented with. The performance of D is influenced by a number of parameters. So the population size, of course, is the first of these. This has a direct influence on the exploration ability of the algorithm. More individuals equate to more differential vectors and more directions in the search space to be explored. So it's important that this is, of course, not too small. Remember this whole discussion we had about genetic drift that comes into play. Um, empirical studies have shown that the number of individuals should be about 10 times the dimensionality of the, of the population. I would say at least 10 times. Um, but um, yeah, this, this it differs from problem to problem. Then, of course, next is your scaling factor beta. This controls the amplification of the different differential vectors. So larger facil facilitates, of course, more exploration. Smaller gives you more exploitation. Usually constant uh, at 0 0.5. But uh, you could also vary it from a large value in the beginning and then progressively uh, make it smaller and smaller as the algorithm starts to converge. Then last, of course, the recombination probability PR. This influences the diversity of the DE. So the higher your probability is, of course, the more you take from your trial vector. And of course, the smaller it is, the more you take from your parent. So also something that has to be carefully balanced so that you get uh, enough diversity, but also a bit, you also want search robustness so that you can have reproducible um, results every time. The control parameters are usually constant. Um, Things like the population size, for example, we will seldom change. Um, but the scaling factor and the recombination probability um, could possibly be dynamic. It could also evolve with the algorithm. They could, there's all kinds of strategies around this that's self-adaptive um, that can also be explored. Now, a number of variations to the basic differential evolution has been developed. In order to categorize these variations, a general notation has been adopted. So this is typically what you'll find in, in the literature. So it's written as DE slash X slash Y slash Z, where the X refers to the method selecting the target vector, Y indicates the number of difference vectors used, and Z indicates the crossover method used. So for example, this whole explanation we've had up till now, we've used DE RAND1 bin, which means we've used a random method to select the target vector. We only have one difference vector because it's the difference between two um, solutions gives us one difference, so one difference vector, and binomial crossover. Um, and we've also used this exponential crossover, so DE RAND1 EXP. Uh, that refers to the basic D algorithm discussed as we've, as we've discussed it in the previous slides. Let's have a look at some other uh, variations on DE. Okay, so for example, DE best 1 Z, here the best individual is selected as the target vector. The trial vector then becomes the trial vector is X hat, so that's the best individual, plus of course the new single difference vector because of the one you have over here. Then you also have DE X in VZ, so here the focus of uh, the X and the Z can be anything, but the NV over here refers to more than one difference vector being used. So the trial vector becomes this case just one target vector um, and then as you can see I've got a number of, uh, of difference vectors so each of these of course are unique um, you, you, they can't be the same and then of course you just sum all these difference vectors together then we have DE RAND to best NV and then whatever recombination you use here the RAND to best strategy combines the random and the best strategy to calculate the trial vector as follows. So you choose a value for, for gamma between zero and one. Then you take a little bit from the, from the best vector out there, plus of course the rest from uh, your, your, your random target vector. And then of course the rest for your um, NV for your number of difference vector you use and then whatever recombination you use with your Z, either min or EXP. 
the indeed you current to best one plus m is now in this strategy instead of using a target vector you use the parent so the parent x i t gets mutated using at least two difference vectors one of these difference vector is from the best individual known and the parent and while the rest are of course from randomly selected individuals so the trial vector becomes as follows so the parent um, that becomes your target vector almost plus of course the first difference vectors between the best and the parent plus of course a whole bunch of random uh, target vectors over here please note that your parent and your best individual is going to be true at least once and in that case of course this difference is going to be absolutely zero so then in that case you're only going to have a look at random uh, vectors around the parent now it has been shown empirically that de rand one bin gives very good exploration properties so in other words it ex explores quite well and that de current to best this last one we had a, had a look at de current to best one plus nv bin gives very good um uh, uh, has very good convergence characteristics so this is a is a good candidate to switch to maybe if 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 the algorithm is starting to converge Thanks everyone, that concludes this lecture on differential evolution. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you and see you in the next one.